right? All right, guys, how y'all doing? Um, so today I'm going to be talking about Balboa Park, but before I do so, I wanted to start off with a quote. Um, this is by um, Samuel Parsons Jr. He was a New York landscape architect. And um, this is what he said when he first visited the Balboa Park grounds before anything was built. He said, with its spreading mesas and rugged picturesque canyons, there's nothing else like it among the parks in the world. So I think that just illustrates the potential of Balboa Park and I, and I imagine what those early figures would have thought if they saw it right now. Um, so my topic is Balboa Park. I'm going to be talking about the past, um, the early past specifically, um, and then talking about like uh, some of the current stuff. Um, so why learn about Balboa Park? Um, well, it actually is the, one of the leading historical and cultural um, epicenters of Southern California. There's a lot going on there. It's a really cool place, and also it's, it's free. So after this, you guys can go there. You can see it, uh, everything that we talk about today. Um, so my credibility, I mean, I, I'm a native San Diegan. I grew up going to Balboa Park my whole life. Um, it's somewhere that I think is really special, and I think by the end of this, you might feel the same. Um, so today, specifically, I'm going to be talking about three points. Uh, the first one is going to be uh, the early history of the park, uh, mainly um, what led to um, its founding, um, and then notable architectural features of the landscape. So it's kind of going to be focused more on um, more of a design bent rather than just more of a general history. Um, and then finally, I'll talk about the current uh, attractions that they have there. So uh, kind of starting out without any further ado, um, I'll start out with the early history. So um, in 1868, uh, the city of San Diego uh, purchased the park. It was just literally blank land. There was like three major canyons. That's a picture of it. That's from 1890, a city map. Uh, there's not really much detail in there, but it's, there's nothing constructed in the park at that point. And for about three decades, nothing really happened. Um, there partially just wasn't enough funding, and there was issues getting like uh, water infrastructure and other utilities uh, up to the area to develop it. Um, so the first major figure um, that I'm going to talk about is Kate Sessions. Uh, Kate Sessions is the woman on the left here. and. Um, a lot of people consider her the mother of Babylon Park. Uh, she was responsible for introducing many of the plant varieties that we see there today and that we see in San Diego. Uh, she brought in plants from all around the world, hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, and so something interesting happened. She was actually leased 10 acres of land from the city to start a commercial nursery. And in turn, she would plant 100 trees in the park and 300 throughout the city. So that was kind of a, um, the initial kind of beautification that occurred. Also, she was um, an advocate for making a master plan that would govern all the future development of the park into the future. Um, that gets me into the second main figure is um, this gentleman here on the right, Samuel Parsons Jr. He was the guy um, I opened with a quote. Uh, basically, he was a New York landscape architect, and he was commissioned um, by the city to do the first master plan, uh, which would, this is it right here. It looks nothing like the park that you would notice today, but city, city boundaries all along the edge, and it's just essentially a collection of trails, roads, formal plantings. Uh, it did um, establish most of the current roads and entrances. So that's a legacy that is still here uh, from, this, from this master plan here. Another uh, uh, really interesting that happened around 1905 was um, San Diego became the host city for the Panama California Exposition. This was a massive World's Fair uh, that would take place in 1915, uh, basically um, to commemorate the opening of the Panama Canal. It was a canal in Panama that was uh, going to be used for shipping freight from the eastern seaboard in the U.S. down through Panama and up into California as kind of a shortcut um, instead of crossing the whole west, de western deserts. Um, so basically, um, they commissioned a new person. This is the third person I'm going to talk about. 
um, which was um, Betram Goodhue. And he was commissioned as the uh, lead architect of the project. He was going to develop uh, all the grounds of the exposition, which is essentially uh, what the park is now. All of the museums, the gardens, those were all constructed for this event. And this is his plan. I don't know if you can see it there, but this is basically the main axis of the park going through. You have the main um, plaza area. This is the Cabrillo Bridge. It comes over from 6th Avenue. There used to be a lake there. Um, but this is basically all of this in here is what most of you would consider to be Babylon Park. Now I'm going to start talking about more of the details on a site level. Um, the initial master plan followed a form of landscape design called picturesque style, which is characterized by long open views, such as this through the center axis here, where you can see really far, and it's usually uh, finished off with like a fountain or statue at the very end. Uh, that was a really popular style at the time. So it's open views, rolling lawns, trees, shrub beds, very more like what we consider to be um, like a park is actually that style of landscape design. So getting into the actual gardens, there's a lot of gardens at the park. Um, the Panama California Exposition was actually nicknamed the Garden Fair because there was over one million plants brought in from all around the world. One of my favorites is the Alcazar Garden, which actually was put in around 1935. But I find very interesting um, because it follows more of an Islamic style design, um, common to specifically this fountain here is Moorish style, so northern Morocco and southern Spain. I find that very interesting that we have that influence of, in Babylon Park, and you actually see fountains like this interspersed around in different areas. The building um, actually. Um, Staying on the garden track, uh, this is the botanical building. This was put in in 1915 as well. This was incredible because <clears throat> it was the first non-glass botanical building ever made, and I think the only one still, and it's also the largest. It was previously um, inconceivable to do this. I mean, a lot of the people that worked on this project were from the Northeast, so crazy cold winters. You know, So this was definitely very different to do. Going into the, um, actually, this is a really funny picture. I thought I'd throw it in. This is a bunch of guys swimming in the pond outside of the botanical building. It used to be occupied by the Navy. Um, and this is actually a swimming lesson. Kind of funny. I wish we could still swim there. It's all lily pads now. <laughs> no, it doesn't. I, this is actually a swimming lesson, so maybe that's why. <laughs> Alrighty, so the building architecture is very interesting as well. It's usually it's all mainly Spanish colonial and like Spanish Renaissance revival architecture. It's very ornate, um, meaning just heavy use of design and patterns. It's not simple. It's very textural, many um, det much detail in the actual design. Um, and it also kind of gave a sense of place to the park because of our Spanish heritage. So um, it definitely uh, sort of highlights that. Alrighty, and then also I'll talk about some different um, elements. It's they use a lot of what's called arcades, which are the long hallways that go through, and that are um, they have arches along the outside. Arcades. That's kind of another sort of uh, Spanish style. So getting into like the current stuff, um, it's 1,200 acres, tons of stuff to do. You know, it's home to many festivals and events throughout the year, Earth Day, countless others. Uh, you have museums. That's the aerospace museum right there on the bottom right. Uh, there's, I don't know how many total, but there's a lot. For sure, and, and there's also like free museum days as well. Um, you can go online and um, see which ones are free on which day and everything. That up there is the uh, kind of art studio area. There's everything from um, theaters, multiple theaters. There's of course the San Diego Zoo on the bottom left here. 
world famous zoo. If any of you didn't know that, I'm sure most of you do. Um, but yeah, it's definitely one of the most famous zoos in the world. Um, as well as all the open, many acres of open parkland, uh, gardens, you know, greenways, natural, even natural vegetation zones where they preserved a lot of the native habitat. So there's a lot of things we wouldn't think we have here that are, that are all pretty incredible. And the best thing is it's all free. So this is something you can actually go there and experience without paying any money. Um, so in conclusion, guys, I've talked about the history, the early history specifically of the park, um, as well as current attractions. Um, I discussed the early development and the people that were um, contributing to it, including Samuel Parsons Jr., the New York landscape architect, Kate Sessions, the eminent horticulturalist, and Betram Good, who, uh, who designed the layout for the Panama, California exposition grounds. I also discussed the architectural styles, Spanish colonial design, and Spanish Renaissance architecture, as well as the overall layout and how it was constructed in the picturesque uh, English uh, style landscape design. So to finish up, I find it amazing how history has the power to expand our awareness of and bring us closer to our surroundings. I hope that my speech has been informative about the cultural and historical legacy of the park. Thank you, guys.